welcome to all of our uh, friends out there, YouTube and Facebook. Uh, you're very welcome to be with us. My name is Greg Fisher, and on the fourth watch, uh, we try to take a look where faith and real life intersect, and where the where the kind of the the rubber meets the road in Christianity. And with me mm -hmm. is my co-host. Hi, I'm Linda Morse, and we're so glad you're with us. Greg and I both have YouTube channels. You can see Greg at Gregory Fisher. You can find mine at Four Right Stuff. And um, you also may have found us on the Fourth Watch on Facebook. Yeah, uh, there will be the Facebook uh, link to the Fourth Watch Facebook page. Uh, it will be at the bottom of the description here for the video, and we'll maybe link other uh, sources down there as well. So uh, yes. take a look at the description, go all the way down to the bottom, and you'll find those links. So where are we today? Well, we've been talking about cults. Um, we started with supernatural evil, and now then we went into cults. And as we talk about cults, uh, one of the things that we have observed that most cults have in common is they have a leader who is infallible. And usually they have received, received some sort of special revelation or interpretation that nobody else in the world has received. So last week we talked about apostles. And uh, apostles. And, um, you know, I think I said this last week, but anyway, it's kind of like uh, a growth industry in some parts of the world. And mm -hmm. uh, even here in America, I, Especially. I keep running into people. I, yeah, I keep running into people that um, are announcing themselves as uh, as apostles. And it, it, it um, well, I, I, I have questions about it, not questions that there might not be uh, apostles uh, operating in in our time um, uh, but questions about how they got to that place and who recognized it and how was that handled mm -hmm. so uh, I think I think that um, I ended up doing a little bit more research on that this week and I think in my mind, I'm seeing there's two words for apostle. There's the noun, and then there's apostolos, which is a verb. Mm -hmm. And it really seems like the verb, somebody who's actually doing what an apostle does, which is preaching the gospel and glorifying God, not themselves. I, I, would, I would say that's an apostle, that someone who just wants the title with actually not doing the verb part of it I'm not saying it <laughs> yeah I, the title the title ha, it has an attraction to it but right then um you know if you're assuming the title and announcing yourself as an apostle then there have to be uh some works that would make it evident to people that you mm -hmm. have an apostolic calling and an apostolic gifting Right. And that's the other thing that we, we seem to forget about when we're talking about apostles. And then later on in this uh, podcast, we're going to talk about prophets. But that is, um, these are both uh, gifts to the church. Apostles are gifts to the church. Mm -hmm. And prophet, prophets are gifts to to the church, but prophecy is a gift of the Holy Spirit to a person. And, and prophets obviously operate a gift of prophecy. Apostles uh, obviously uh, have the gifting of working of miracles and, and uh, other things like that, the gift of faith. At which operates inside of them mm -hmm. and uh, allows them to complete apostolic work. Um, 
but I, I but to but too many people are looking at the gift to the church and and then making it into something else like an office the office right. of the prophet or the office of the apostle it's not mm -hmm. an office it's a gift to the church right um in fact you have um you had a very interesting thing you sent on uh, the difference between Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets. Do we want to go there or do we want to go into some descriptions first? Well, let's go into some descriptions because we okay. can describe <laughs> what it is we're talking about. Yeah. And, uh, you know, as you pointed out, rightly so, that apostles are ones who are sent. And what they're sent with is a message. Right. And prophets are also sent with a message, right? Yes. Yes. In, in kind, I think in kind of a different way. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, apostles, which we don't have any, uh, uh, you know, we didn't see anything about apostles in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. But prophets definitely are there. Right. And, so as we move uh, between apostle and prophet, a lot of times things start to get really confused. Um, we can say apostles are sent ones, they're sent with a message, they're sent to accomplish something, they're sent to expand the kingdom of God. Uh, that's, that's kind of a New Testament. When we get to prophets, then that's where the, a lot of the confusion comes in. So a prophet in the Old Testament is someone mm -hmm. who spoke for God. They were um, um, foretellers, actually, mm -hmm. and also forth tellers. They foretold events in the future and they forth told the word of God to the people. And they often had it pretty rough in the Old Testament. I think of some of the things that God had them do, like marry a prostitute to show Israel what, what <laughs> uh, that she's doing. And um, Isaiah had to go through some pretty, pretty, rough stuff too didn't he uh yeah uh, uh you know the prophets like um, um isaiah uh, had to lay on his side for two years yeah <laughs> and so uh, if you have the, also... yeah if you have the gift of prophecy be glad it's new testament not old right yeah well and then uh walking around naked uh, to uh, illustrate something, uh, yeah. or uh, being swallowed by a fish. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. These guys, these guys uh, live some kinds of lives, and um, th and 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 being a prophet, being a prophet was not a money making operation. I, in fact, it had great cost usually. It had huge cost. The mm -hmm. prophets in the Old Testament uh, invariably were martyred. Mm -hmm. uh, and nobody wanted to hear what they had to say. Well, no, because they weren't saying uh, what was, um, you know, uh, popular to say. Right. Ooh. So even if something's unpopular, we don't get a pass on saying it? <laughs> No, you know, here's the thing. Uh, Jesus, uh, in his ministry, was quite confrontational. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, he didn't give a pass to sin at all. No. And a lot of times in the church today, what I'm hearing is, you know, we just need to love. We just need to love. Well, we do need to love. But we also need to stand for the truth. Jesus said, I'm the way, the life, 
uh, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. And whoever believes in me, if you believe in me, you're going to have eternal life. That's the kinds of things that he said to his disciples. And, and uh, wow, that was confrontational. Well, and if you look at even our families... Um, we don't want to stir anything up, any controversy, so you don't say anything. But really, it's hard to see a loved one on a path of destruction and call it love when you don't say anything. Yeah. Or, or to see a whole generation on a path of destruction. Right. And call it love when you don't say, excuse me, but... Right. This is not only is it not biblical, it isn't true. And, and that's where that's where that verse speak the truth and love comes in. Yes. And and that would be that that now we're starting to talk about the New Testament about a New Testament prophet mm -hmm. when we start talking about speaking the truth in love because um, we we have to you know, there has to be this broken heart mm -hmm. that is behind the prophetic um, gift. There has to, the, the, the words that come oftentimes are words of correction or mm -hmm. instruction, and they need to come out of a broken heart. Out of our broken heart. Yeah. There's a... I, that reminds me, there's a song that says, let my heart be broken for what breaks yours. Yes, yes. Let my heart be broken by the things that breaks God's mm -hmm. heart. And uh, there's so much uh, out there. And so as Christians, and especially as Christians that are standing for the truth of the gospel, we need to just say this is this is the truth, and it doesn't look like. I mean, I'm, this is I'm going to step on some toes here, and that's probably well, a good thing. <laughs> I'm good at that. Um, it doesn't look like standing outside an abortion clinic screaming at women. Doesn't look like. Standing at even a gay pride parade screaming at people. It looks like coming face to face with individuals and saying, I, like, you know, like we have a, a place here in town called Bella. And they work with young women who are pregnant. And it looks like coming alongside of these young women and say, hey, I understand you're terrified. Can we talk about this? Can we pray together? Yeah. And same thing, um, uh, we don't want to do it. A lot of times as Christians, you put homosexuals out there and we want the separation. But how are they ever going to know the truth if we don't come face to face and speak the truth in love? In love, yes. And um, I, I, had a, I had a dear friend, still a dear friend, mm -hmm. um, that planted a church in San Francisco downtown in the 1980s. Okay. And that was right at the beginning of the HIV epidemic. And, you know, the, the, there was such a division, there's such separation between the evangelical world and the homosexual world. And so um, he went to them and said, how can we serve you? How do we serve your community? Right. And they were stunned. And after talking and and discussing back and forth, he said, okay, one uh, Sunday evening per month, we will have prayer uh, for those who have the HIV virus. And they, and you know, they were bringing people in literally in on stretchers and he was they would the, the church would pray over them and that was a time when you know 
touching somebody with HIV was like, you're going to get it. Yeah. And they were touching them and loving them and embracing them. And it had a huge impact uh, on that community at that point. But he never, ever, um, uh, you know, uh, made a, a way where uh, homosexuality would be okay. Right. But um, as he, he and I talked, he said, well, but lusting after women is not a prerequisite to salvation. Can people be saved? Yeah. yeah. But we expect them to live lives uh, that are in harmony with the word of God. And that means that if that is your orientation, you might need to be celibate because uh, uh, sexual activity outside the bounds of marriage um, is, uh, is a problem. Right. Yeah, that's a, it's a big ministry. And I, you know, we've been very good at ignoring some of the wide open fields, the people who need to know that they're loved the most. Yes, and not only love, but also uh, confronted with confronted with the truth. Right, and to know that there is forgiveness no matter what. Yeah, I mean, I know you have experiences um, having been a counselor, an uh, alcohol and drug rehabilitation counselor. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, people I'm sure have to be confronted with um, uh, the dimensions of the mess that they're in before right. there can be any healing. And that's the first step when somebody says, I can't control it. That's the first step when they recognize the results of their choices and that. And one of the things with drug and alcohol is you see people at different ages and at 18, they might look like they're 30 and at 30, they look like they're 60. And none of my clients ever came in and said, oh yeah, when I was 16, I knew I wanted to be an addict when I grew up. Yeah. You know, these are things that you make a bad choice and then you make another one and you make another one. And as Christians, we can come alongside of people and say, all right, uh, let's practice making the right choice. Let's give you tools to make better choices. And if you make a bad choice, one of the first things I like to tell my clients was don't use. If you do use, tell me. Because you can't go anywhere if you're hiding it. No, no. So sometimes it's just a matter of bringing this stuff out. I've, when we had our business, we had a lot of opportunities to speak with people who were homosexual who came through. And um, some of them were more receptive than others. <laughs> yeah. But, because there have been so much hurt over right. that issue. Right. And some of them were very very kind sweet people they were just you know you can plant little seeds and it's not us up to us to change someone it's up to us to speak the truth in love and the holy spirit wow can use that amen so you, you know uh, go, as we start thinking about false prophets and po mm -hmm. false apostles um i like a note that you put in our notes today, and that was that uh, one of the signs of a false prophet and false apostle is that they're motivated by money. Right. Follow the money. And a lot of times they're motivated by power. Yes. Uh, there's. I used to teach pastors, and I would tell them um, there are three things that will end your ministry. There are three pit holes or, or, or pits that ministers and, and ministry people fall into, and that is money, sex, and power. And, and it's, I've watched it over and over in my life that uh, 
people fell and and destroyed their their own ministry money sex and power but let's i i want to touch on that just a little bit yeah because as a pastor as a missionary um as an evangelist look at billy graham you do need an income but yeah. But the big thing is, as a church, we do need to take care of our leaders, our pastors. But having, I'm, I'm not a fan of committees, but you need a financial committee to oversee this. This is not something that needs to go through. Uh, some, sometimes the person handling the money can also face accusations. So it's a matter of protecting your leaders if you have somebody else do this. Yeah, that's, that is true. And, uh, you know, it's a struggle when, uh, as a ministry person, it's a struggle mm -hmm. uh, to have the right kind of understanding and then the right kind of relationship with money, of course. Uh, it requires uh, uh, money to fund your ministry. Uh, in my last in my last job or position uh, in missions, um, I was administrating about eight million dollars a year. Now none of that was mine. Not one penny of it was mine, and. Um, you know, if you're tempted, uh, if you're a person that is tempted uh, by uh, the, the, the love of gain, um, you need to get that under control. Otherwise, it quickly shifts around from uh, we need funding to reach people with the gospel to I need to be supported in a way that I will be able to go and uh, and do whatever I want to reach people with the gospel, but there's no accountability at the end of the day. Well, and then there's a point too where I need a new suit. Oh, it'd look really nice if I had this great ring. It'd look. Re I should show up in a car so I'm more um, impressive and can. I, you know, there it can be one of those things that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Yes. Well, the, the second Corinthians verse, second Corinthians uh, two seventeen, uh, where Paul says, for we are not like so many peddlers of God's word. And uh, if you look on YouTube today, we have a lot of people peddling God's word. They are, uh, uh, but Paul says, uh, but we were as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. And, and that's one of the things that makes, the, makes a division. Um, there are people that I have seen um, on the field that, uh, especially in Africa, um, that they were just peddlers. Well, you can make a good living doing it. Yeah, and and I I um, I have a dear 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 friend who I hope isn't watching this because he would be embarrassed at my uh, production value, but he's been a producer of, uh, 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 in television for ever, and he so in his career he's worked for all the big names. Uh, in in Christian television video and all the big mission agencies up to the largest and he's produced the videos and and things for them and so we would sit around at night I don't know if I should tell this or not we'd sit around at night and and he could he could do impersonations of all of the televangelists because he'd worked with all of them okay and uh, I'd, I'd throw up a name and 
and uh, he could do it. And I remember um, that I said, you know, uh, I, I said um, to him, okay, well, do Reinhard Bonnke. And the guy said, eh, I don't do that because he's the real deal. Ooh. And there are that what had come through, what had come through from from working with Bonke was that he was a man of sincerity commissioned by God. And I want that to come through as well uh, when I'm doing ministry as a man of sincerity. Yes, uh, commissioned by God. And Paul, when he was speaking at the time he wrote this, he was being criticized by the Corinthians because he was a tent maker. That's not a real reputable pro profession. It's not white collar. He's actually working with his hands. And they're going, we offered you money to preach for us. And he said, I didn't want to be indebted to you. <laughs> yeah. So he may have had some insight into what was behind some of that. Because he did take money from other churches, but just for basic support. And I always loved what Billy Graham said. He had people do his money. And he said, I need enough to survive. I don't have to survive in style. But he says, I don't want any part of the money. Yes, he, he was a very humble guy. He was. And very, and, and he's another one of those people that came across as a, as sincere, as a man of sincerity, not only sincerity, but also integrity, as commissioned by God. So uh, this is why uh, we have to be so careful. This is why as Christians, we're actually addressing Christian issues. Because yes. when we hide this stuff, when we don't want to talk about cults, when we don't want to talk about church abuse, when we don't want to talk about the things that we as Christians need to be working on, it takes away our authenticity. Yeah. We have to be honest that as Christians, we still fail. We're still working on it. You know, one of my favorite stories about Billy Graham um, was um, he, he came to Los Angeles to do the funeral service for uh, a woman who was married to one of the early um, founders in our in our denomination one of the early really uh, great ministry people and he came all the way from North Carolina to Los Angeles California to speak in that to speak to the funeral and only about 20 people showed up wow. but one of them was a nephew mm -hmm. and he shared how this these this couple, the man and now the wife, had lived their lives and served God so wonderfully. And he said to the, as he's speaking, he, he addressed the young man and said, young man, I have come here today to urge you to follow Christ. Imagine that. That's sincerity. That is sincerity. So, uh, and, and I think one of the other things, and you noted this in some of your notes, was uh, the, what we find on, on YouTube and on the, on the TV, uh, what we find is uh, things like um, boasting. Mm-hmm. Right. If a pastor is preaching about how wonderful his life is instead of how wonderful his God is, yeah. 
run, run. <laughs> and I and 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 you know some of the <clears throat> this is what's really embarrassing. <clears throat> even even in my own denomination, uh, I go to conferences. I'm going to be at a conference next week. As a matter of fact, I go to conferences and I hear I hear leaders. Uh, speaking and preaching and what I'm hearing is so shallow it's embarrassing uh, it's embarrassing to me I, I hear stuff that has not been well thought through has not been has not been weighed and scriptures that have not been exegeted and this is passing uh, for something that is supposed to be really, really important. And it's so superficial. And I think that that's also a problem, especially when we start talking about the Word of Faith movement. I hear, I've heard all of that teaching. Um, and uh, if you attended ORU during the years I was there, you definitely were going to get uh, quite a bit of that uh, kind of teaching, um, especially in the chapel. But sometimes it's so shallow, and and but but people try to uh, trot it out as though it were some great revelation. Um, uh, that we should all pay attention to. And you're sitting there thinking, that's really quite shallow, and that's not what that verse is supposed to be saying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that those are marks of false uh, apostles and false prophets. Well, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, 5, what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Amen. And it's all about Jesus. If, if our ministry is not about Jesus, we're self-serving, not Christ-serving. Now, we're going to talk about prophets because I had this pretty cool thing in class <laughs> this week <laughs> where uh, someone mentioned that the prophets are all of the Old Testament. New Testament prophets don't exist. There's no purpose for them because there's nothing new to learn. And you said something to me earlier, right before we started the podcast, that you considered yourself uh, more of Correct me if I get this backwards, but you said that you considered yourself more of more prophetic than priestly in your ministry that you've had. Yeah, I what I said what I was saying was um, the church has a priestly and a prophetic calling in the world, and I tend more towards uh, the prophetic. And the prophetic is more that confrontational, uh, confronting the dominion of darkness and calling it out, con confronting error and calling it out. And so, yeah, I'm, I, I tend a little more towards the, pro the prophet thing. <laughs> but so I, what's, what's the priestly look like? Well, I think the priestly is the, the caring ministries. Um, the, 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 the going out and loving people on the street and, and, uh, which I've all, I've done all of those ministries, but I'm, I'm more oriented towards something else. Priestly ministry means that you're out there, uh, uh, interceding, uh, on behalf of the people. Kind of a shepherd. Before God. And, and. And trying to bridge that gap uh, between the lost and dying and uh, the God who is the Savior and and proclaiming that the prophets the prophetic part 
is also coming along and saying, when this is happening, that is ungodly. And speaking both to the church and outside the church to say, this is the way of God and we need to walk in it. When I started counseling, I was at, when I was interviewed, I was asked, so are you a truth person or a grace person? <laughs> and I didn't even hesitate. I said truth, but I'm working on grace. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes truth looks like looking someone in the eyes and saying, how's that working for you? Is it time to try something different? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's that's. That's the Dr. Phil. <laughs> oh, no, don't compare me with Dr. Phil. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's the one who will say, so how's that working out for you? Okay. I think I saw Dr. Phil like once. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not big on TV. <laughs> so let's get into this profit thing because we talked about how at the beginning cults usually have this leader who's very... Um, often they're charismatic and they believe they have this special revelation or this interpretation or they're the ones who know how to do things right and they're going to set the rest of us straight. So they usually take the title of apostle or prophet. And so this is really important for us to know because there are both of those in today's world who claim apostolic and prophetic rights, vision, authority, you know, it looks different. So let's talk about this. We said, uh, tell me about Old Testament prophets again. Well, the Old Testament prophets <clears throat> were a, a kind of a, a different class of prophet. There's there's several words in, in the Old Testament in Hebrew uh, for uh, prophet, and one of them would be something that we would call a seer and another would be uh, someone that we would call a a a person who is uh, foretelling or warning about the future and so um, the old testament prophets uh, weren't always um, literate Elisha and Elijah were were probably not literate because we don't find anything written by them. Uh, there are uh, the other prophets that were writing prophets, uh, but Elisha and Elijah, I like them because they, they were more confrontational and they were also uh, more uh, attuned to the signs and wonders uh, that established the truth of their message but they Science. were the old testament prophets spoke and wrote as they were moved upon by the holy spirit and they had some pretty intense things happen i mean when i think about elijah i always think about he had a mountain type experience that most of us would just it seems like it would be so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. and, and it was for him. <laughs> and it was. It was. Because he, he went from Mount Carmel, where he stands on this mountain. And the they built these they built these altars. And the prophets of, of Baal have been there all day long crying out to their to their god who by the way was the storm god and what oh. was the problem it hadn't rained for three years and so they're they are uh, in a contest and they're imploring their deity uh to answer by uh fire uh and cons and to consume this offering and uh and and elijah's over in the corner and he's taunting them, you know, kind of, hey, you know, he maybe, maybe he's asleep today. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe cry louder, cut yourself deeper. <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the things, one of the taunts that never get um, really 
fully translated into the English, um, that at least I haven't seen it, is is more along the lines of, hey, he might be sitting on the toilet. Oh. So, you know. Yeah, that probably wasn't translated accurately. Yeah. Did they have um, terms? Um, I think I think the King James or or something translates it as uh, maybe he's in his study. Oh. Okay. Proving that uh, it's not just twenty first century men who read things in the bathroom, um, and so uh, you know, but. And then uh, Elijah stands up when it comes to be his turn, and he says, the whole uh, nation of Israel is there, gathered around the mountain to see what was going to happen. And he says, uh, you know, choose you day, today. If God is God, if Yahweh is, is, the, is the Elohim, if God is God, serve him and if baal is god serve him and we find the people say are not saying a word and then the short little prayer uh, that elijah prays and boom uh the fire comes down from heaven now that was like lightning but and he did earth. more than that he took his sacrifice and put yeah, buckets water of water on it, on it. So it wouldn't burn. Yeah. And it did and, anyway. Yeah, it, it went up in flames. So um, this is an example of an Old Testament prophet because he was warning about an impending judgment. And also Old Testament prophets could be uh, problem solvers. Remember, they, Elisha is the great one for that. He was the great problem solver. And, uh, you know, people came to him and said, you know, this is a nice place. We could have a nice town here. But the water uh, that we get is sour. And he said, and Elisha says, well, what do you have? Bring me some salt. Bring a bag of salt. And he throws it in the water and it becomes drinkable. Now the salt didn't really cure that, but the 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 the, the action of the people coming with the salt uh, and and Elisha throwing it in is uh, one of those times where when you are belief in God and he counts it to you as righteousness, God moved on their on their behalf. And I mean, there was so every time Elisha performs a miracle, it is always predicated by what do you have? What what are you bringing to the table? And we don't. OK, so we mentioned a couple times that God answered with signs and wonders that were just wow. In this television age, why why are we not seeing? I mean, we have people that claim signs and wonders and they're not always, sometimes they're more gaudy circus acts than actual answers from God, right? <laughs> yes. So yeah. does God still do signs and wonders? He most certainly does. Um, I, I, I can tell you that he most certainly does um, do signs and wonders. And sometimes they're quite, uh, spectacular um, you know when I when I was a little kid before even my brother Dana was born uh, we lived uh, with my grandparents in, in Burbank California my dad was going to Bible college and I remember uh, my dad and my grandfather this is probably yeah, I, this was after he graduated from Bible College and he, uh, we lived in West Hollywood and they were in Burbank. So it's like a five minute trip over there. And, um, and 
I remember my grandfather and my dad talking and they were talking about an evangelist that was uh, holding meetings at their church. And the evangelist uh, would call people out and say to them, you know, God shows me that you have cancer. Well, 1952 or 1953, that was a death sentence. Mm-hmm. And they would, and so the people would become emotional, and they, and so they would gather around the the evangelist and his wife, and they were praying, and people were just, I mean, earnestly uh, calling out before God, and then uh, the and then sometimes uh, the 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 person would gag and spit up a cancer. And, and, um, and I remember my dad saying to my grandfather, well, what did it look like? And he said, well, it kind of looked like a chicken liver. Well, well, later, later we got to know that the evangelist's wife, you know, she always had a hanky in her hand and people were, would be be crying out with such intensity that they would be perspiring and she would be wiping the face and inside was a little piece of chicken liver and they would just you know inject it into the mouth and the person would gag of course and spit it out there's your cancer god healed you well that that, you know that's not a sign and wonder (laughs) no that's not a sign and wonder as a kid, I would be around all of this stuff, and I realized two things, and and why at the age of seven or eight or nine I could realize this, I don't know, but I would realize, you know what, there's some real, and there's some fake, mm-hmm. and you have to figure out between them, and I began to realize yeah, a lot of stuff I'm seeing right here is fake. Right. But there's a real God and there's a real Holy Spirit and he does meet the needs of people. And 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 I kind of grew up with that understanding uh, in my mind. And we, uh, maybe that helped me in the future. I don't know. We're going to be getting into uh, church abuse down the road. And I want to say this now and we'll say it again later. It doesn't matter what organization you're in. There are hypocrites. Oh, my. This is not um, knowing that some of these churches are frauds is not a reason to not go to a charismatic or Pentecostal or evangelical church because evil is going to infiltrate everything good in order to discredit it. We have Very to be true. Good. We have to be discerning, and if it looks like the leadership of this church is not authentic, go to a different church. It doesn't mean you give up. (laughs) Yeah, uh, you don't kill Christianity because a church is bad. No, and we'll get into some stuff that's not going to be very fun. (laughs) Yeah. But... It does not make church bad. It means that sometimes even good men can do bad things. And sometimes there are bad men masquerading as good men. Yes, and sometimes, you know, you're a good uh, a good guy. You're a good minister. Uh, but... Uh, you, there's this pressure every week to pull the hat, the rabbit out of the hat, right? And and so, and and pretty soon, you know, people are trying to manipulate uh, something uh, so that so that they they can continue their reputation or continue uh, to be admired uh, by people, right? There's yeah. great differences between Old Testament and New Testament prophets, by the way. 
Yeah, and we're getting into the, you're pulling me back in this week. <laughs> Let's get into the New Testament now. Yeah, the, 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 the uh, New Testament, this is something that's really important if I can get it across. The Old Testament, there were seers that uh, would find things for you or, or, or see into the future or uh, all kinds of things. They were seers. And, and uh, when, when Saul in the Old Testament uh, is sent out by his father to find uh, the donkeys that have gone off, the the the, uh, the mules and uh, donkeys that have gone off, uh, then um, he can't find them. They're out there for like three days, and he can't find them. And so he goes to consult a seer uh, about finding the, uh, the 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 donkeys, and then and the seer tells him, "Well, they've been found, and they're back at your father's house." But also the spirit comes upon Saul and he begins to prophesy. And the people start wondering, well, is he now going to be a seer or what? And now this is before he was anointed as king. But in the New, Test New Testament prophets are not seers uh, to be consulted. So and that in the New Testament, they or in the Old Testament, they would go seek answers from the prophets. But right. in the New Testament, we have the Holy Spirit. Exactly. Let me let me share a story that is really pretty sad. Um, when I was a, a young pastor, and we were in Boise, Idaho, uh, serving a church there. And we had some uh, university students from uh, the university that were attending church. And one of uh, the young ladies uh, had uh, been in a home meeting where there was a person there claiming to be a prophet and prophesied over her that God was going to give her the desires of her heart. Now, the desire of her heart at that moment was a certain young man. And uh, she believed that God was going to arrange for her to be married to that young man. And you could not shake that out of her. You could not, you could not uh, dispute it with her. She was going to marry that young man because the prophet had spoken. Uh, the sad almost conclusion of it is uh, the day that she went, the guy lived in a trailer park and uh, went to the trailer park, removed all of her clothing, was running around totally naked, shouting, what's wrong with me? You need to come, you know, um, and, 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 of course, the police came and, and collected her, and she was in uh, the psych ward at the hospital. And uh, it's pretty hard in a case like that to get into the psych ward because they view you as being part of the problem. And I wasn't. And I was trying to, ha you know, I was trying to, to follow up and, 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 see if we can't rescue her out of that delusion. To my knowledge, that never happened. So I'm very clear. New Testament prophets are not seers. You don't go to them to, to be consulted, uh, to consult on them. And, um, you know, there are people, people come to me all the time. Um, um, uh, I, I believe God has a word for you. I'm very careful at that point. Someone comes to me and says, I have a word from the Lord for you. Um, I, I put on my skeptic glasses. Mm -hmm. 
And um, sometimes I just won't, I, sometimes I'll just say, no, thank you, please, not right now. Uh, <laughs> but there have been times in my life when I've been struggling with an issue or struggling with a decision, someone has come and said, I think the Lord uh, is working in your life in this direction. And it helped me to, it helped me to choose a direction or a decision uh, that I was struggling with. Uh, but always the word from the Lord confirms in your heart what you've already been struggling over and praying over. So, um, yeah, it's not thus saith the Lord, you're supposed to go a completely different direction. Yeah. I, in fact, New Testament prophets should never say, thus saith the Lord. Because, because it's not the Lord speaking through them in the same way that happened in the Old Testament. You know, as I hear you speak, we had a, it's, it reminded me, we had a hiker come through the ranch one time. And he was the only one there, so I was talking to him, you know, because he was kind of, uh, they don't have a lot of people on the trail to talk to sometimes. And I don't know, it, it, this random thought would come into my mind and I'd say something and he'd go, oh, I was just journaling about that. And then something else, so, you know, and I'm, I'm trying to not be intrusive, right? Something else would come into my mind and I'd say, well, what about this? And he'd go, oh, I was just thinking about that. I th Look at, I was writing about it. <laughs> and it went this way most of the night. Mm. And there was one point where um, I said, so what are you going to do when you get off trail? And he says, well, I have a nephew who doesn't have a dad and I need to be a a good male role model for him. I said, okay, all night long, we've been talking and I have said nothing to you that God has not already said to you. But you already told me you're not walking with him right now. When you go be this role model to your nephew, what's that going to look like? Is that going to include God? Are you going to listen to God? Or are you going to do your own thing still? <laughs> uh oh. Now, so, that's an example of a New Testament prophetic gift right there. Okay, because it was totally not me. I had no, Yeah. I didn't think of these things. God just used my mouth. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I, I prayed over a guy one time and, and afterward he said, how do you do that? Yeah. And I said, do what? I don't. He said, <laughs> he said how, how can you pray the very thoughts that are going through my head? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, well, I think it's the Holy Spirit. I have one friend that I would talk to and she'd say, all right, just get out of my head. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, wow. yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we're coming up at the end here. Okay. Of, we got to, uh, we got to finish this last little sentence that you put in there. Oh yeah. Where is it? A new Testament prophet. prophet exhorts it, believers exhorts the believers yes to maintain a consistent standard of conduct and sometimes they will warn of events to happen in the future that's new testament right and uh, it, i had notes on the new testament prophets that uh, um, to just kind of back all of this discussion up that come from uh, the end of the first century, early second century uh, church fathers. And they definitely accepted and understood and appreciated both the office of prophet and the gift of prophecy. And we may touch on this a little, we, we will, because we usually circle back around. We'll touch on this a little bit next time. We're going to talk about Christian scientists next week, aren't we? Yeah. As my old prof used to say, uh, that is the grape nuts religion. 
<laughs> because grape nuts are not grape and they're not nuts. Yes. And uh, Christian science is not Christian and it's not science. Hmm. Yeah, we, we can get into some big names with that one, too. <laughs> so um, we're so glad you joined us. We hope that you'll come back and see us again next week. And our purpose, our goal here is to honor and glorify God. We want to point you towards Jesus. We've mentioned several times that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And if you don't know Jesus, we need to talk. <laughs> and we are always, we're always willing to answer questions, dialogue with you. Mm -hmm. um, pray with you. Pray with you. Uh, you can uh, you can contact us through the Facebook, uh, the Fourth Watch uh, Faith Facebook page. Leave comments here on the YouTube or on uh, Facebook. We will uh, take seriously any of the comments and questions that you have. And uh, I want to say how much we appreciate you, uh, the listener who is uh, uh, tracking with us. And thank Wait. you for uh, pressing on the like and the subscribe mm -hmm. button because our, our subscribers are growing, the likes are growing, and we're, the ministry is expanding on YouTube. And that's, that's really what we want to have happen. It is. And we want you to, this week, think about discerning when you're looking at, at pastors and that not being critical, but discerning true prophets and true apostles. Yeah. Amen. Well, you have a good day. We're going to come back and see you next week. And God bless you all.